Betty bought a bit of butter, but the bit of butter Betty bought was bitter. Hello, you plonkers, and welcome back today to another video on the True Footy channel. Nine things we learnt, round two. Free or shit. Okay, great. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. No, oh, a lot of front up. All right, let's talk about nine things we learnt from AFL round two. Two, the support on the True Footy channel recently has been immense. Jesse has officially ticked over 20,000 subscribers. So everyone, I want you to comment, congratulations, Jesse, on this one. And just keep supporting the content through those small things like liking, commenting, and sharing with your mates. That sort of stuff goes a long way. We appreciate it greatly. Now that you've liked the video, let's get into the nine things that we learnt from AFL round two. Number one. Colton's best win in recent memory. Last week, I spoke about Colton's inability to manage games, especially late, especially against big sides. And boy, did they just answer that question against the Cats. They didn't stop playing to win for the entire four quarters. It was a complete four-quarter effort. And even when they got out to that comfortable lead, they managed to hold on, which we've seen them bottle so many times before. The fact that it was against Geelong, the Premiers as well, I mean, it just speaks volumes to the potential of this Colton side. And Charlie Kerno, man, I mean... We saw how much potential he had last year. He obviously won the bloody golden boot, or whatever it's called, the Coleman in the AFL. Um, <laughs> but he's just the fool with that every side wishes they had. A powerful lad, one-on-one, -on -one, you can't beat him. Literally kick it up on top of his head, one-on-one -on -one against a defender. Good luck trying to stop him. Man, he's powerful. He had five goals, nine marks, and pretty much won this game for the Blues. What a talent he is. Their new acquisition, our Blake Akers, did one or two good things. And Ollie Hollands is uh, looking like he's going to be a very good player as well. Kid can run for days, fam. Doesn't get much better than that for Colton fans. Well done. My hat, if I had one, would be off for you. Big win against the Premiers. Number two, Brisbane flex their muscles before bizarre finish. For three and a half quarters, I think we saw Brisbane at their best. They were intercepting all of the D's long kicks, which I'm not a fan of the long bomb anymore. I've had enough of it. You've got to build the ball up slow. But Brisbane would intercept it every time and then launch very well from half back, chipping the ball up, using their midfielders to build up the play and then go quick once they had an opening. And Dunkley and Ashcroft coming into this side is just absolutely insane. The impact that these guys had on uh, Friday night, I think it was, was absolutely massive. Will Ashcroft had the most disposals on ground for the Brisbane Lions. 31 touches and a goal at the age of 18. Are you shitting my dick right now? Talk about how good Nick Dacos is, a generational talent. Will Ashcroft is one year behind that. He's going to be a superstar, this kid. And around the contest as well, just this midfield depth. It's so OP, even though they're coming up against Clayton Oliver and Petrarca and Viney, guys that we've seen can deliver flags to a football club. Like, if it's not Lockie Neal, it's Will Ashcroft. If it's not Ashcroft, it's Dunkley. If it's not Dunkley, it's McCluggage. If it's not McCluggage, it's bloody Berry. The depth fam, it's insane, and is paying dividends right now for the Lions. And then the light tower sets on fire, probably an event caused by Satan himself to get his demons back into the game. You know, Brisbane, they lose all their momentum, the players cool down, and the demons bloody storm home and kick like seven goals in a row and only ended up losing by, what, like eight points or something like that after being clearly outclassed all night. Bizarre game. Brisbane, they looked really good. Forwards, kicking sags as well. The usual contributors. We don't need to talk about that because we've already learned about that. But Brisbane, they flexed on Friday night against the D's in a big way. Especially considering that Melbourne have sort of had the wood over them for the past few years. Now Brisbane have won their last two meetings. It's a big win for Brisbane. Number three, Collingwood are genuine flag favourites. All of the hype surrounding Port Adelaide after round one has quickly been evaporated up to the clouds. And I saw you were big on the power, Jesse. You look like an idiot. No, but in all seriousness, this Port side could still be good. But they're not as good as Collingwood, who right now are my favourites to win the Premiership. They look like they are having a ball out there and pumping sides while they do it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Nick Dacos is going to be the best player in the competition one day. I already think he's a top five player in the competition right now. He kicks with efficiency, hardly ever turns the ball over. He just looks like he's having fun, glides across the, gl the grass, the arse, and the glass, all at the same time. <laughs> that goal he kicked when uh, Pendlebury handballs it over his head just sums up what Collingwood are about right now. Everything that they do is just coming off. Handball over the top of the head, Nick Dacos, shrug a tackle, and then just stroll into 50 and go, all right, I'll bang this in like it's nobody's business. Bang. He kicked another good uh, goal when he was lining up for a set shot, goes around, Bangs it in. Man, this kid is so special and he does it with such ease and swag. 
Swipe! And once again, they grabbed the momentum of the game, kicked nine goals in a row, and the game was over before halftime. Collingwood, right now, their box office, pay-per-view type stuff. They're playing extremely well. I don't see a weak spot in this entire side. I think their additions have been great as well. Bobby Hill, Mick Stay, and Tom Mitchell, they're all contributing after only two games. So there is no real downside at the moment for Collingwood, and for that reason, they are my flag favourites. Number four. Tigers outclass the Crows despite crazy comeback. In the second quarter, Richmond were at their best. They were moving the ball terrifically well from their back half. Noel Bolt had a massive game down there. He's really showing how impactful he is, the big man. But their ability to transition the ball from the turnover into the midfield and get the ball out into space was immense. I thought it could have been a 10-goal margin going into halftime. And it nearly bloody was. But we expect the Crows to fight every week. I think that's a given now. We know that they compete every single week. It doesn't matter the quality of the competition that they're coming up against. You just know that they're going to fight tooth and nail until the final siren's gone. And they erased a 45-point margin down to a one-point lead, the Crows. Now, the Tigers, that is quite worrying that you let a lead that big slip. We saw that last year against Gold Coast, and it cost them. So that's going to be something that Richmond have to stamp out. ASAP. But all that big comeback takes a lot of energy. By that time, Adelaide were stuffed. Richmond could impose their class again, and they ended up winning comfortably by five goals. My best on ground was Liam Baker. I think he's really starting to find his feet at the AFL level. He's already won flags and everything. I'm not saying that he hadn't found his feet, but he's just looking like he's really hitting his straps now. Hitting his straps in his prime. You know what I mean. Composed on the ball, silky skills, making it look easy. And shout out to Samson Ryan as well. Second game, three goals from four kicks. Great effort, young lad. See, when I stuff up, I can just make noises like that and you can just like, you know, like edit me nicely. <laughs> Please. <laughs> This video is in partnership with Druzy's Athlete Academy, my business, which helps deliver results to you. True Footy, as you now know, is partnered with my brand, Druzy's Athlete Academy. As a qualified exercise scientist and strength and conditioning coach, I like to help young boys and girls achieve their fitness goals. When you're starting out at the gym or you're an athlete, you really don't want to have any guesswork in your training. If you're showing up, you want to be doing the most effective exercises planned over a period of time to guarantee you get the results and achieve your goals. Druzy's Athlete Academy, I guarantee you achieve your goals. If you want to talk about your fitness journey or your needs as an athlete further, hit me up on Instagram at Druzy or at Druzy.AthleteAcademy and I'm doing free video consults. So if you want to have a chat about where you are with your exercise, fitness and athletic goals, let me know. I'll be happy to help. Druzy's Athlete Academy will help you achieve your fitness, physique, exercise and athletic goals. Guaranteed results. Message me on Instagram or go straight to the link in the description to go to the website. Let's get on with the rest of the tings. Number five, St. Kilda five-star display. Despite their injury list, St. Kilda are playing some really good footy under their new old coach, Ross Lyon. They're scoring really well off turnovers. When they cause a turnover, they're going fast and they're moving the ball through the middle of the ground, which you always want to see. They had two young lads up forward in this game in Mateus Philippou and... Owens, not sure his first name, not going to lie, but they kicked bags between them. It's good to see that St. Kilda have some solid youth coming through with those two guys kicking three goals each, as well as Wanganeen Miller in his second year also doing some good things as well. So it's good to see the St. Kilda youth shining through. They kept the Bulldogs to one goal in the second half and just five for the game, which is absolutely outstanding going. It's been a perfect start to life under Ross Lyon for the Saints. Congratulations, you're doing very well. It's just about whether you can maintain this form all throughout the 23 rounds. Because obviously last year you had a similar start, played some really good footy, and then just shat the bed in the second half of the season. But I think you're playing to your strengths as a side. You've got a lot of quality to come back in. So Kilda could make the top eight. Number six, Clarkson coaching masterclass. Frio looking lost. Right, the phone goes away. Druzy moaning about Frio part two out of two. Right, first off, absolute credit. I know I said this last week about St. Kilda, but absolute credit to North Melbourne. They deserve to win this game. Better team for four quarters. They implemented their game plan better than Frio did. I think Clarkson's got them playing really good football. Whenever Frio would get inside 50, North would just take this thing out. Literally just chip the ball, own the ball, dominate possession, and that's what they did. And it just completely stopped Frio bringing that, that chaos and the momentum that we do with our midfield. Completely took that out of the game. And it was a pretty poor showing from our midfielders as well. Guys that usually show up every week, Brayshaw, Sarong, Will Brody, um, yeah, got outplayed by Luke 
Davies Uniaku is looking like a genuine star of the comp, and Jai Simpkin as well. I think both of those Ruse players were the two best midfielders on the ground. Starting to worry about this midfield mix. I think I said it last week, but Brayshaw, Sarong, Will Brody, even Jago Romero, they're all contested balls. We're missing David Mundy. We're missing guys like Adam Chera uh, with that silk and the bigger bodies as well. Nathan Fife is a massive body to have in that midfield who we've had for years, and we're missing that. We're inexperienced. I think this list has taken a step back with experience after losing Blake Akers, another big body, David Mundy, 300 and whatever many games he played, and then Griffin Logue as well, a massive part of uh, what Frio were for the past few years. Um, this loss had a real lack of character about it. I think we just looked lost out there. We don't look like we have an identity right now. And I am not usually critical of the coaches, but I think a massive part of this loss has to be on the coaching staff, in particular, Justin Longmuir. One, the team selection. I don't want to see Matt Tavener play for the Dockers anymore. Like, as harsh as that may sound... All throughout these years where Freo have struggled in front of goal, Matt Tabner has been our key forward every week. He doesn't offer us mobility. He's not dynamic. He's one-dimensional. It's literally kick it to him in a little bit of space. And if he can run straight onto it and mark it on a lead from good work from the midfielders, he can do okay things. He might be able to kick two or three goals. But when you see a power forward like Charlie Kerno, what he can do, even a guy like Jake Waterman, what he was doing for West Coast against GWS... You just know Tabano is so far from it. Obviously, he's been plagued with injuries uh, throughout most of his career. Both hamstrings tightened up against the Roos, and he got subbed off for two weeks in a row. Michael Walters comes on, completely changes the game. So, Matt Tabano, I'm sorry. I said it last week. I don't want to hop on the get-out bandwagon, but Matt Tabano is not good enough for this Fremantle side. We've seen it before many times, but if this didn't put the nail in the coffin, we now know that Matt Tabano is not our key forward to go to. And I'm upset or disappointed with the lack of ability to take our learning from last week. We struggled to deliver the ball inside 50 again, despite having enough chances to deliver the ball inside 50, which is why I think it's on the coaches. We've got enough talent to be able to kick a ball from the center square to the inside 50 arc, but why can we not do it? Why are our players leading to the same spot every time? Luke Jackson, Sean Darcy, and Matt Tabin are literally all crossing roads when they're trying to lead to the ball. Uh, it looks chaotic, not in a good way, looks unorganized up forward. There's no head honcho up there. There's no one that puts their hand up and goes, I'm the top dog and I'm going to win this game of football for our club. Brendan Cox goes up forward and gets a goal. So uh, yeah, lots and lots to unpack from this Frio game. I'm very disappointed with the loss. Two winnable games against St. Kilda and North Melbourne where we have to try so, so hard for every goal that we kick and we lose narrowly in both of them. Just if we could have two or three hit-up kicks to a key forward that can kick goals like Jai Amos, we win that game. We win the game against St. Kilda. So I can't question the effort and the physicality and the desire to win. It's the method. It's the strategy that we're taking into games that isn't working, which is why I think it's massively on the coaches. This game was a coaching masterclass from Alistair Clarkson, whilst the Freo players look lost in their game style. I could talk about Freo losing all fucking day. It sucks. Just on team selection, I don't get why a kid like Nathan O'Driscoll doesn't play. I've been massive on him. The Freo fans absolutely love him. He has a great kick inside 50, and he's passionate. He puts his body on the line. You know how much it means to him to play for the football club. So I think that X factor and that character is something that we lacked, and we could definitely use next week against West Coast. Number seven, Swans punish an uninspiring Hawks with Buddy's understudy snagging bags. How's that for some alliteration? Syntax. The effort of Hawthorne in this game was exactly the opposite of what I'd usually expect. From watching Hawthorne in the last two years, what you can like hang their hat on is that they're going to graft for four quarters and compete and be relentless and tackle and chase. But the pressure rating in this game, I didn't even see it, but I know it would have been so low. They looked like they were defeated from the moment that the ball was bounced in the first bloody quarter. And the Swans did what they do best. Their pressure was immense, smothering, tackling. Their ball movement was clean, although not the highest defensive pressure to execute those skills against. But I wanted to point out their two big men up top, their two big young men. Logan McDonald, who was obviously drafted a few years ago from Perth, he kicked five goals and he's clearly put on a lot of size over the offseason. It always takes a bit of time for a power forward to become that power forward. They come into the league, they're frail, they're not powerful, they're just forwards. Even though Logan McDonald has had all the skill, he needed to beef up, which you can do with Drewsy's Athlete Academy. 
Side note, Logan McDonald has all the talent in the world, but now he's got the frame and the size to allow that talent to shine through, I suppose. So he looked really good. And then Joel Amati as well, four goals. Got some really big, long, accurate set shots in this game as well. Big bombs. Um, and he, despite his athleticism for the size that he is, he's a genuine freak of nature, this kid. So good to see that two power forwards can step up in the absence of Buddy Franklin. Buddy's only studies <laughs> snags, snags against the Hawks, who pretty much looked uncompetitive, to be honest. Number eight. Essendon's pressure overruns the poor old sons. Essendon's pressure is night and day from last season. Props to Brad Scott for getting this side regimented and allowing them to compete for four quarters, which eventually, I think, in the end, got them the chocolates over the suns. The game was in the balance. Three-quarter time was neck and neck, and even early in the fourth quarter. And I just think their ability to run, chase, pressure, backed by their home crowd at Marvel, got them over the line in the end. Will Setterfield has added a lot to this Essendon midfield as well, I think. 25 disposals plus and a goal in his first two rounds in the red sash. And when you've got guys like Andy McGrath with 25 plus, uh, Parrish, Merritt, even Dylan Shield contributing with goals as well, they all had 25 plus. You can't just rely on Tuke Miller, Noah Anderson and Matt Rowe to win your games of football, especially when you've got this amount of quality coming through the Essendon midfield. And Gold Coast, I'm just, I feel bad for you, but I just think your ceiling, it's so much harder to push up than any other side. I just feel like, where do they go to from here? This is a hard one for Gold Coast. Should we Jews going to come under the spotlight again? But what can you do? Poor old sons. And number nine, West Coast Giant win makes for a massive derby. West Coast come out in the second quarter kick eight goals against GWS and have a happy Sunday afternoon at Optus Stadium. And I am fuming. Bias aside, I really like the look of a couple of their young players who played. Ruben Jinby, straight into the mix, inside mid, looking good, looking like a, a bull, which is what West Coast need. And Noah Long didn't have too much of the ball, but when he had it, he did a lot of good things. So props to that young man. Elijah Hewitt was the emergency sub, someone that I've worked with closely as my time as a strength and conditioning coach, training athletes. Now in the AFL, shout outs to him. He only came on for a little bit, only got three touches, but very good to see a young WA prospect getting into the AFL system and he'll be very good for years to come. So we're starting to see some youth injected into this West Coast side. They moved the ball really well, West Coast, to be fair to them. Um, and Waterman kicking four goals, Cripps, and their new uh, acquisition in Jaden Hunt. They all had multiple goals and got a fair amount of the ball as well. So unlike Frio who they're playing next week in the Derby, which is massive now, their forwards can kick goals and get the ball. This now feels like a do-or-die game for Frio. West Coast come into this season with no real expectations, but I would say, not even kidding, West Coast are the favourites going into that game. Now, that might sound ludicrous, but based off this year's form, West Coast have showed that they can actually kick the ball to their forwards to mark it and kick a goal. We do not have an Oscar Allen. We do not have a Jake Waterman. Whether it's identity personnel or system, West Coast's ability to kick score is better than Frio's. And ultimately, that is what wins you games of football. So Frio have to really put in some graft this week <laughs> to come up against West Coast, who you'd think we'd smash at home on paper coming into the season. But now it's a do or die game. And as we know, derbies are a whole different kettle of fish. It doesn't really matter where you are on the, uh, on the table on the ladder. When it comes to Derby Day, it is fiery, it's feisty, the crowd is completely different, the whole dynamic of the game is different. So yeah, it's it's gonna be a real squeaky one. Not gonna lie, I'm shitting my pants for this Derby because it's Frio's time to win Derbies, but we are not in the form to win this one. So yeah, massive Derby coming up. I really hope Frio win. I will be streaming it on the Druzy YouTube channel as well, so make sure you check that out. And there's the nine things that we learned from round number two. But before you click off the video, come here. Come here. Look. Leave a like, leave a little like ski, and comment down below what you learned from the round. Share it with a friend if you thought it was good. And subscribe to the channel if you're new as well. True Footy Road to 50k is on, baby. <laughs> we appreciate you watching. Keep it locked to the True Footy channel, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care, you plonkers.